So next Saturday, I get to officiate a, a wedding. It's an honor to be there with uh, this couple in, in that moment. It was a few months ago where I got to meet with this couple. As I met with many couples in the past who are planning to get married, certainly to plan out their ceremony, but even more than that, to just do some pre-marriage counseling to fill up their treasure chest so they have wisdom as they get into their marriage relationship. One of the questions I always ask uh, right away is, in your minds, what is going to make your marriage a great marriage? What's going to make your marriage a great marriage? And I do usually have the guy go first because the girl's always going to correct him in, in what he says. But I always ask the question, what in your mind is going to make a great marriage? And so they give me two or three things. And typically what is said, actually every time what is said by both of them is communication. If we can communicate well, we're going to have a great marriage, which is very wise, very wise. And then the second question is, well, what makes a good communicator? You both said this. What makes a good communicator? Talk to me about communication. So they give some answers. And typically what comes up again is a good communicator is a good listener. A good listener. Well, what makes somebody a good listener, I ask? Right? And couples will share this over and over again. Someone who can remove distractions. Right? There's a distracted listener that does exist, not just a distracted driver, but distracted listening, right? The art of listening, right? that we would learn that today, not for a marriage relationship, but for our relationship with God, our Creator, our Savior. It was a few months ago in August, uh, we were planning out what's going to happen here at Trinity with worship, with worship in the fall. We have hopes and dreams. We want to get back to where we were. We want to continue to reach people with Christ's story and we want to continue to disciple through worship and allow God to do His thing as we gather both here at Trinity and certainly online. This is a big deal, what we do with worship. And it was in August this past year where I was wrestling with a lot of things. The elders were wrestling with things, that the worship team, the pastoral staff. And the night before the elders where we had to make the decision, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't sleep, so I was up at 1 o'clock in the morning. I kept asking throughout this process, God, just give us clear direction. There are options on the table. Just give us clear direction. Please speak. And so it was about 1 o'clock in the morning, I was up, all of a sudden 1.30, I'm not going to sleep, and then my conversation with God typically starts happening after a little bit, and sometimes it's right away, but it's God, all right, you got me up. Is there something you want to say to me or not? Please just call my heart and my mind right now so I can just go to sleep because I need rest. You know I need sleep, but if you want to say something to me, please say something. About a half hour later, I'm still up, and all of a sudden I'm, God, right, come on, what's going on? What's going on? And I hear, be still, be still. So my response to God and my conversation with him in the middle of the night was, I am being still. I'm completely still right now. I don't know how much more still I can be, so if you have something to say to me, please say something to me, God. So a half hour later, it's still, be still, be still. I'm, all right, I'm getting frustrated right now. Right, I'm being still. If you really are saying something to me, I think you are, but be still doesn't really make sense right now. Why am I being still? Because I am still. And so me and God are wrestling with this stuff through the middle of the night, and all of a sudden, a few hours later, all of a sudden, discernment takes place where all of a sudden, oh, be still in the sense of don't change anything right now. Certainly things need to change. Things need to be tweaked. But be still in what we're doing with worship. Be faithful to the styles, to the times, to the place where we are and online. For right now, yes, things need to change. We need to get back into the gym. We need to do that. But be still, Justin. And so I go back to bed, get about an hour of sleep that night, wake up. In the morning, go to work, right? I got elders that night. Get to the elders meeting. We have these three uh, options for us when it comes to Trinity and what we're doing with worship. And I could have, again, art of discernment, I could have said, hey guys, God woke me up in the middle of the night and here's what we're going to do because God said this to me. Right? But I didn't do that because that's not what we do in a situation like that. That's not wise. Instead, it was, guys, Here's the options. Let's talk about the pros and cons. Let's talk about where we believe the Spirit could lead us in this, in this, and in this option. Where are we with the resources? Let's talk through this to make sure we're unified in discerning God's voice together. And you know what the elders decided? To be still. And I remember sitting there in that moment just thanking God for our elders, for discernment, and just feeling very confident. God did speak to me in the middle of the night. Right? Discerning the voice of God. Maybe the question is, have you ever heard the voice of God in your life? And if so, how did that come about? How did you discern that? Uh, I have a book up here. This is the book 
the good book, as Johnny Appleseed called it in his Johnny Appleseed story that I read to my kids. I used to read my kids the good book, the Bible. The Bible, 66 books written over 1,400 years, covering 6,000 plus years of history. Right? The Bible, this is our, our source as disciples of Jesus. We turn to this just like those that have gone before us that have turned to this for God speaking, for God leading us. And so as we seek to hear God's voice and learn how to discern God's voice through prayer, and again, prayer is not just us talking to God, it's us talking with God. Right? The art of listening. And so as we are here in this moment, uh, there's some, some theological uh, structures that we do have within the scriptures and how theologians who have gone before us wrestle and try to understand how God speaks. In the Bible itself, uh, there seems to be three big categories. General revelation, generally God speaks, he has spoken. Special revelation, special revelation and direct revelation. There's some other theological categories that we could get into, but we're going to stop just right there. But general revelation is this truth that God speaks, and he tells us this in the scripture, that he speaks to all mankind. Everybody has a moral conscience. Everybody has this moral code that God has given. We know right from wrong. Everybody has that planted seed inside of us. God spoke into each of us, and he continues to speak into each of us. The scriptures speak about that. General revelation, the scriptures say that everybody, all mankind, has eternity, eternity placed into their hearts so everybody knows that this is not it, that there is more to life. We all know this as human beings created by God. And also everybody knows that there is a God. People can say there is not, but yet they still know there is. God has revealed himself. General revelation, he has spoken to us. Special revelation within the scripture is in fact the actual word of God. When the word of God is spoken, we call this special revelation. What we know in special revelation is the word of God became flesh in the person of Jesus. Right? This is special revelation. Special revelation says this word is actually living and active that was breathed out and in through the Holy Spirit of God and that yes, there's a specific context and a specific place for specific people, but yet, the scriptures themselves testify to say, no, this word was not just for them, it's for all of us, for all mankind, for all time. That this word holds true. In special revelation, we say this, many of you have heard this said about this book. This is a love letter. This is a love letter from our Father. That he has spoken to us, he has not been silent. So general revelation special revelation than direct revelation where God speaks directly to the individuals. It's a little bit different than special revelation. I'll just kind of go through where my mind went as I was preparing this message and thinking about direct revelation revealed to us within the special revelation of God. Uh, God speaks in person. Garden of Eden, right? Adam and Eve. He's right there speaking to them. Where are you? Talking to them. Asking them why they did what they did and telling them what to do and what not to do. He's speaking directly to them. God himself speaks directly to Abraham. God himself speaks directly to Samson. Right? He speaks directly, and certainly he spoke directly through Jesus to the disciples and to mankind. While well, Jesus was here, God, in the flesh. Right? Direct revelation. He spoke through dreams to a young man named Joseph in the first book of the Bible. He spoke through dreams to another young man named Joseph in the first book of the New Testament, the gospel at the birth of Jesus. He actually wrote on the wall one time directly. It's recorded in the book of Daniel. In the book of Acts, you see him speaking directly over and over again through thoughts, through intuition, and not just in the book of Acts, but throughout the scriptures, God directly gives visions to people, direct visions. God spoke directly to a donkey one time. God spoke directly through circumstances of an animal, a big fish and a man named Jonah. Right? He spoke directly through the fish. He spoke directly through a bush, a burning bush to a man named Moses. And many other signs and wonders, God spoke directly within the Scripture. And even the rainbow. Right? Yes, it's in the Scriptures, but it's still to us today. There's a promise with the rainbow. In the book of Acts, you actually see people use lots to try to figure out the direct voice of God, lots, casting lots, almost like drawing straws, and that God spoke through that. 
There's something called an ephod. When you look at King David in the Old Testament, you see him constantly inquiring of the Lord, and the Lord actually speaks back to David, and that's through something called an ephod, these stones that God would give him a yes or a no, that God would give him a clear direction. Right? Direct revelation in the Scripture. There's written word to each other. There's direct revelation through the mouth of the prophets, spoken word, taught word within the Scriptures. There's trials. There's actually sacraments, baptism and communion. God speaks directly in those sacraments as we see them within the Scriptures. God speaks directly when, when people forgive each other within, in the Scriptures. God speaks directly with wise counsel in the Scriptures. When God speaks directly, sometimes He whispers and sometimes He comes through, through thunder. Right? In many more ways, God spoke directly throughout the Scriptures. The people who asked Him questions, who came to Him inquiring about a situation that they were facing, and also times He spoke directly to people who weren't looking for a word from the Lord. He just spoke. And the question for us in this moment is, are we listening Jesus said in John chapter 10, my sheep know my voice. My sheep know my voice. And yes, I am convicted and convinced that God does speak through the Scriptures. And we're going to get into this more. We're going to allow this to continue to guide us. God speaks to us through this special revelation. He does, and this is living and active. What I know in my own life is that yes, I'm convicted and convinced that God speaks directly, directly, And the question is, when God speaks directly to us, how do we discern? How do we discern the voice of God? And so let's go at this, certainly. Then we're in a sermon series called what? Lessons Learned. Lessons Learned. And so I just want to talk about lessons that I'm learning in my own relationship with God through the Scriptures, through the special revelation of God and just how He's taught me to discern his voice. Uh, John chapter uh, 4, it's 1 John. He talks about testing the spirits. John says you got to test the spirits because there's different spirits out there. There's different voices out there. Uh, Pastor Chris and I were talking about uh, this whole year with Prayer Warrior and how we're going to really try to teach the congregation not just how to speak but how to listen. And we reminded that within the, the seminary uh, education that we received that we talked about this and, and the four voices that oftentimes we hear we hear different voices, and so we got to test those voices, test the spirits. One voice is our own voice, right? We hear our own thoughts. Another voice is the world's thoughts, right? What other people are saying or what the world is saying directly. Another voice is the evil one's voice, Satan. And the other voice that we desperately desire to hear and why we're here right now is the voice of God. And so how do we discern the voice of God versus the other voices that we hear. And so the process that I want to share with you today is a five-fold process that I'm learning in my life. And the first part of the process is the pause. The pause. And that's where we're at right now. Whether you're in your home or here in the sanctuary, we're pausing. Right? We're slowing down. Psalm 46 verse 10 says, Be still. Be still and know. Right? God calls us to listen to him, the, the pause, right? to remove distractions, to slow down. Right? How busy are we? How busy are you? Right? Yesterday I coached six basketball games. Right? I, I, I preached a sermon here at, at Trinity. Right? I had a bunch of other things going on. Right? How busy are you? How busy are we? Uh, someone actually wrote a book, and maybe you've heard this said, uh, we're too busy, too busy to pray. We're too busy to pause. And what this, this pastor said in response, and what I would say is, we're too busy not to pray. If you're too busy to pray, you're too busy not to pray. You're too busy not to have a holy pause. There's so many distractions, and even in our prayer life, right, it's just us just because we're busy, and I can't slow down. I just need to tell you what's on my mind right now, God, but Thank you for hearing me. We're busy. But for me in my life, Justin, learn to pause. Learn to have a holy pause. And in that pause, right here's where I'm going to speak to you very clearly. The second uh, part of the process is to ask. Jesus actually said ask. Ask. Ask me. Seek. Knock. And you're going to get your answer. Ask. 
Right? So in that pause, what is the question that we are asking very specifically that we can get specific in the question? Right? If you got a choice to make, God, which one should I do? If you're in a, a moment, and many of us face moments all the time where there's trials, where there's suffering, where we're just kind of feeling the way of the world, right? what's the question? Maybe what I'm learning is the question is, God, what do you want me to know in this circumstance? What do you want me to know right now? And then what do you want me to do? What do you want me to know? What do you want me to do? And ask the question. In the Psalms, I love that the psalmist says, ask God to search their heart and convict them. Right? Is there something false? Is there a lie that I'm believing God? Please tell me. Please identify that lie. Please allow me to confess something that's causing anxiousness, the, the thing that's causing me to sin. Allow me to confess that to you so that, God, please give me the truth that I need to know in this situation. Right? And as we ask that question, right, then we get the answer. And when we get the answer in the pause as we ask the question, that's listening. Listening. When we listen to God, I'll, I'll share this with you. This was shared with me uh, uh, years back, a couple decades back, and discerning the will of God in our life, the voice of God. And, and maybe this will hopefully be understanding uh, for you. Uh, in my backyard, my backyard, I got a raspberry patch, a blackberry patch, some strawberries. We got a garden usually in, in the summertime. We got slip and slide that can come out. We got a pool that can come out. We got a tire swing. We got a Ninja, courier, ninja Warrior course in our backyard now. We got uh, a trampoline. Uh, we got a bunch of open grass where you can play cornhole, disc dunk, wolf ball, volleyball, badminton. Even a game of croquet could be done in my backyard. We got a croquet set, right? You got all these options in the backyard. You can just go on a hammock if you want to go in the backyard. Right? You got all these different options. And what I believe and what has been passed down to me, what the scriptures speak about, is that God gives us a fence for our backyard, right? for our, our life. And when we go to God asking questions or seeking to make decisions, there is a clear fence. Right? A clear fence. I mentioned that as the moral code, right? Things not to do. No matter what, you know that's not God's voice. And it's so important for us to know that. Right? When we go to God, if we hear a voice that we know is against God's word, right? okay. That's outside of the fence. And what I love about that, that illustration that was taught to me, uh, revealed through the Scriptures, right, is that when I go to God and I got some different choices to make, and they're within the fence, they're within the fence, like I could go to the trampoline or I could play wolf ball. Both are good things. You know what happens in my relationship with God as I listen to His voice? Sometimes it is, God, Justin, you need to do this specific thing. But most of the time, most of the time in the sovereignty and, and the free will of man, and we could get really deep theologically right now, and most of the time God takes a weight off of me and says, Justin, all these things are good. Go for it. Go for it, Justin. Right? You can play wiffle ball. You can do cornhole. You can do the trampoline. They're all within the fence line here. You make the decision, and I'm with you in the decision. This is a safe decision. Your options are good. And sometimes, right, it's clear, okay, I need to go do this within the bounds of God. And certainly when we listen, when we listen to God's voice, we do hear correction. We got to be ready for that. And his promises that he will correct us. And certainly his promises when we're listening to God's voice, there's going to be encouragement. There's going to be clear promises. We sang about these promises, right? He's with us. He is faithful. Right? He's going to give us courage and strength, right? That's his voice and that is clear. Right? And certainly in the Scriptures, when we seek to listen, the Scriptures teach us in the listening process right, to seek wise counsel. Right? Proverbs 19, 20. Right? Seek wise counsel. And so the question in your listening process is who are your elders? Yes, you do have elders here at Trinity, by the way. They're your elders, not just my elders. Right? Who are your elders? Who are your people around you that you trust in discerning the voice of God over your life. Yes, I have held elders here at Trinity, but I also have people in my life that I know God has used and that God will use to help me discern His voice. And so I'm very sensitive to that. And certainly as we talk about listening, we do listen to the circumstances that God is putting around us as we're seeking His will in a moment. Right? We do that by, by faith. We look for those signs. 
So pause, ask, and listen. The fourth one is confirmation. Right? That God will confirm what you hear him saying to you, certainly through his word, please. Right? He does that. He confirms through others. Others. And certainly the communion of saints, meaning those who have gone before us, that we can see what people have done in the past when they've been faced with many of the same things that we have been faced with. And we can see godly wisdom come from there. That's how God confirms. Peace. Let's talk about peace because there's peace in, in confirmation, but maybe it's a different kind of peace than when we think about uh, Jenny and I, we were married for a few years. I was working at a church in Troy doing college ministry. It was an awesome ministry I was a part of. I loved everybody I worked with. Jenny and I, we were by our families, right? We were financially provided for. We were hoping to have a family of our own. And all of a sudden, I start having dreams of God saying, clearly, Justin, you need to go become a pastor. Right? So what did I do with that? Certainly, I shared that with others. And I clearly shared that with my bride. I love what my dad told me when I first got married, Justin, God's going to speak to you through your wife. Right? Jenny, please never abuse that. <laughs> right? Wives don't abuse that. But there is something very true about that. Right? And so Jenny at that time, and before that time, right, she was saying, ah, like, a pastor is going to be different than what you're doing right now. And I don't know. I don't know if that's good for us. Right? I don't, I don't see that. But all of a sudden, when I shared that with her, all of a sudden she says, yeah, I think we should go for it. And so Jenny and I made this decision based on where we thought God was taking us, the God's voice in that moment. Did that mean that there was peace? We don't know what's going to happen financially. We don't know where God's going to send us. We don't know what's going to happen with these relationships that we have. We don't know how distant we're going to become from our families and our friends. There's some anxiety, there's some fear, there's some real concerns, but yet there was a peace, right? And so the circumstances might not seem peaceful when God guides us in a place. And I say that picture, right, Peter? Peter, come and walk to me on the water. Right? Again, Jesus did not make it light out, didn't take him into two feet of water, kept him in the middle of the night, in the middle of the sea, with five-foot waves, however big they were. That was still happening, and Peter had to get out and walk. Right, so we need to be very cautious with confirmation based on peace and just realize peace is there, but is a peace that surpasses all human understanding. That's what I'm learning in my life when it comes to confirming the voice of God. And the last part of the process is this, is once we've gone through that, right, there's learning. There's learning. We've got to be humble in the learning. Uh, there's something that takes place here at Trinity as a church. Based on the scriptures, we believe that there's a divine call process when God calls people here to be ministers. Right? We go through what many of us understand, right? a job search. Right? We get names. We go through interviews. We have a committee. We call it a call committee talking uh, to individuals, right? trying to discern the voice of God. God, who are you calling us to call in this moment to be part of our ministry here at Trinity, and then all of a sudden it concludes with we come to a voters meeting after a bunch of processes of trying to discern the voice of God and where God is guiding us. And we ask the congregation, hey, here's where we're at. What do you think? And all of a sudden the congregation says, we confirm it. Let's call them. And also, you know what the individual gets from us? A piece of paper that says the Holy Spirit has convinced us that you are the right person to be here. So Trinity's been here 140 years, right? We've gone through this process several times, hundreds of times. You know how many people have said, yeah, the Holy Spirit's convinced you, but the Holy Spirit hasn't convinced me. You're wrong. That happens. That happens. And what do we do when that happens? Not just in that process, but when we've gone through this and we're, we're thinking, yes, 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 Thank you, God. And all of a sudden, oh wait, did I mess up? We learn. We continue to be humble, trusting in God, leaning into Him, right? learning how to discern His voice, trusting in Him. We're not defeated in that moment. All right? We take a breath, say, you are sovereign, you are God. I am not. We're trying. Have mercy on us. Help us to listen better and help us to learn through this process. 
Right? Lessons learned. When I was 19, and many of you know this story, I was blessed through my whole life, up to 19 years old, to have a Christian family, uh, Christian truth spoken over to me. Um, I got the opportunity to go to a Christian school, a Lutheran school, not just from elementary school, but also in high school. But somehow, some way, um, I was stuck in guilt and shame for about five years. When I was 19 years old, I was in a pause moment like this, and I was in college seeking to hear God's voice because I was just a big hot mess. And I was just trying, God, please. And for 19 years, I heard people say, God loves you, God's forgiven you. You're God's child. I heard that over and over again. But somehow, some way, I wasn't hearing it. And when I was 19 years old, in a pause moment like this, there's a song being sung, and all of a sudden I heard the voice, Justin, I love you just the way you are. Not as you should be. I love you just the way you are. Justin, you are forgiven. Justin, you are my son. I have forgiven you. I will forgive you. I love you, Justin. And I share that for many different reasons right now. But I hope and I pray you hear over and over again because it is the voice of God. That he does love you. He has forgiven you. He is forgiving you. Right? There's a big cross behind me. Right? I think about that moment that Jesus faced. Maybe you haven't heard about that moment, but God in the flesh, Jesus, comes to reconcile us to the Father, to redeem us, to take on our sin and our punishment in our place for breaking the moral code. But in that moment, Jesus, is anybody listening to him? Is anybody listening to God in the flesh on the cross? Everybody's denied him, betrayed him, they're mocking him, they've abandoned him. But yet what I love, and this is the gospel, this is the good news, because even when we weren't speaking, even when they weren't speaking, even when they weren't listening, when they weren't listening to him, he didn't give the silent treatment. He spoke from the cross, and when he spoke from the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Father, forgive us for not listening to him. Father, forgive us for not discerning his voice, for listening to our own voice, for listening to the world's voice, and listening to the evil one's voice. Father, forgive us. You know what our Father says right back to us? You're forgiven. You're forgiven. I am here, and I want to listen to you, and I'm going to speak to you. May we hear his voice. And may Jesus continue to be the clear voice of God for us. May the Holy Spirit cause us to discern his voice. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.